question. All right, so welcome everyone to the, the third lecture in this year's University of Cambridge Archaeological Field Club seminar series. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Professor George Church. Uh, he's the Robert Winter Professor of Genetics at Harvard Medical School, the Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at both Harvard University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a founding member of the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard. Uh, he has been called the founding father of genomics and published the first direct genomic sequencing method in 1984. In 2017, Time Magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's author of Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. Uh, he's also the founder of Rejuvenate Bio, a company dedicated to studying aging um, and even how to slow or reverse it. And in 2021, um, was one of the founders of Colossal Bioscience, uh, which is currently working to resurrect the woolly mammoth as well as the Tasmanian tiger. Uh, so if I listed all of his achievements and academic interests, we could be here all day. But with that, I would like to welcome uh, Professor George Church. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, share my screen here. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't want to keep us here all day either, but I would like to get some uh, lively questions at the end. So hopefully I'll be provocative and uh, and there'll be time for that. So uh, this is, uh, I, I put the name of your society here on the on this page and my full conflict of interest in the lower uh, right hand corner web page. And we're just resurrecting genes. We're not resurrecting species, although uh, you will see that it's um, functionally equivalent. And and in many cases, we're we're introducing genes. We're making gene species that are more uh, suitable for current environments and saving endangered species is kind of the, the goal here. So it's about diversity and using ancient. And some of what I say, say may sound uh, impossible, useless, or science fiction. Um, and so to make you, you know, at least partially believe some of it, I give some examples of things that were all in those categories before uh, uh, from my, my, most of them from my lab. Uh, so just some of you may know more than others what these mean, but uh, we've done single molecule sequencing. Start this, we started doing this in nanopores uh, the idea goes back to the 1980s. Uh, molecular recorders, so so rather than reading but writing, and we've written up to two terabytes uh, in a mouse. Um, uh, many of these things I won't go into detail later on. I'm just giving you examples of things that have made it uh, through the even despite uh, being characterized as impossible, useless, or science fiction. We've brought down the cost of uh, reading genomes by 20 million fold. Um, a form of writing of genomes is gene therapies, and that's been reduced from um, as high as $2.8 million a dose to $2 a dose. We've got aging disease reversal has been shown now for about six different diseases in mice and a subset of those in dogs, and soon uh, human clinical trials will be starting. We've uh, shown that we can make a sort a section of a protein up to 100% change, meaning all the amino acids in that short segment. Um, that was a kind of a holy grail for about 50 years to be able to do that design. We've shown that we can get resistance to all viruses. We've made one cell that's resistant to all viruses, and I included some some field work. I'll, I'll actually point out that what what we call field work um, in a few of these slides. And then finally, we've done multiplex editing for enhanced organs. This is a a pig that that has been a, a, a variety of pigs that, that are uh, multiply edited in and donating organs. Okay. Um, so you can say we shouldn't be changing the world. The problem is we already have. Uh, and so the question is, what do we do to make it balanced? Uh, so we have 96% of the mammalian biomass worldwide, not just in uh, industrialized nations, 96% are now humans and their livestock, um, and 77% of the cropland, which is vegetables, is used for animals. Um, 
So uh, this doesn't have to be it. And and not only are we destroying, re removing species, we're also creating species, mostly by hybridization. Um, we could fit into a smaller footprint. 83% of the USA lives in um, urban areas. Um, and uh, this used to be almost none of us lived in urban areas uh, not too long ago. Um, there are there are actually uh, improvements in both photosynthesis, electrobiosynthesis, and conversion of photosynthesis via photovoltaic intermediate. Uh, photovoltaics tend to be more efficient, uh, even the most efficient photosynthesis, and we can convert them to wavelengths which are more suitable for photosynthesis. You can see the classic uh, blue and red um, lights in a photobioreactor um, because they ironically don't absorb in the green. They reflect. Um, not everybody appreciates that, but this is what you know. Typical U.S. Uh, uh, sky shot looks like uh, all these uh, irrigation fields. So to do this, I'm going to show this twice. Uh, we want to have faster biomass doubling. Um, <coughs> the amount of land that we use um, is related to how fast things uh, double. And uh, for example, one of our fastest crops is corn. We've managed to now squeeze in two seasons when it used to be one, sometimes even three. Um, but the double, biomass doubling time is on the order of 17,000 minutes. And I do it in terms of minutes because these, uh, um, this, the, this used to be the record holder for biomass doubling in the world, E. coli is what everybody uses in the lab. We, we've, we've, uh, developed a, a, a contender for replacing E. coli with something that's twice as fast. And, and that's for heterotrophs, meaning things that don't require light. Um, and those that, and then organisms that do require light, we found through field work in my lab to that we can get some both prokaryotes and eukaryotes that can, that can double as 90 minutes. So that's a far cry from corn at 17,000 minutes. Um, and it kind of shows where we're going with this. And this is all in the context of the exponential technology improvements that, that I kind of alluded to in my, that first slide about impossible, useless. Um, here, we've brought down, uh, this is factors of 10 on the y-axis. And so these are really radical uh, changes in, in productivity and quality, um, 20 to 60 million fold, depending on how you count it in reading and writing DNA. And it's still, that those are still improving, um, and they and they impact a whole variety of of fields: diagnostics, therapeutics, um, and so on. So what we do is we influence ecosystems, which are in the order of exagrams, ten to the eighteenth grams, by manipulating one of the smallest units one can manipulate, which is uh, something about the size of a of a hydrogen atom, one atomic mass unit by editing from A's to G's. Uh, so we call this yoctogram to exagram. And here's, here's an example where we change, um, um, by replacing a nitrogen with oxygen, we change by one atomic mass unit. Um, we, can, uh, we can edit repetitive elements. This was another thing that was dismissed as being impossible or useless. Uh, we've now edited, our record is 24,000. These are all the repetitive elements. We don't need to go through them. These were considered dark matter, hard to read, even harder to write. We've now made 24,000 edits. Uh, I'm not gonna go through how we edit, but it's a deaminase that deaminates to A to G, as I showed before. 24,000 in one cell line. Um, it happens to be human cells uh, from my body um, that are induced pluripotent stem cells so they can differentiate into a whole variety of cells as you'll see in a moment. Um, so we changed, um, so this demonstrated two things. One is that you could you can tolerate that number of changes because previous attempts we we were getting lethality of the cell lethality at just a hundred edits. So now we push that up with a very careful attention to not introducing any um, double strand mix in the DNA while we're doing this deamination reaction. And this is work from Corey, Oscar, Khalid, Farina, and Raphael. Now, how does this apply to um, uh, the, you know, the, the environment, to conservation of endangered species, 
um, re restoration of um, compromised uh, plant and animal ecosystems. But what we have is a problem in, in the Arctic in general, not just Siberia, about uh, 19 million square kilometers, which has changed radically over the last you know, 20,000 years, we think uh, at least in part due to, large part due to human uh, predation, humans uh, killing off a lot of mega herbivores, including uh, mammoths. And this is the consequence is that the, the, the permafrost is melting. It has, there's a lot of carbon in, in the Arctic. There's, there's some places 500 meters thick as contrast to more like a meter thick in the tropical rainforest. And that's because each year you add another layer that freezes. So it's the perfect sequestration engine. But now it's melting. And what's happening is the methane is being released. Here's, here's my collaborator, Sergey Zimov, um, showing that, that the Karst lakes are, are um, full of methane that can be ignited, reducing it to CO2, which is much better, uh, methane being 30 to 80 fold worse than carbon dioxide for global warming. So we have this uh, elephant in the room, endangered elephant, where we have 1400 gigatons at risk in the Arctic, plus uh, possibility of sequestering new carbon uh, because it, that 19 million square kilometers isn't dedicated to um, uh, any, you know, any of the civilization related things. And so, uh, and to put 1400 gigatons in context is nine gigatons per year uh, carbon that, that humans uh, produce, nine or 10. So a keystone species is missing. Um, it, it, by shifting the ratio of grass versus trees toward back towards grass, restoring the grasslands uh, can reduce th temperature in three ways. We want to reduce the temperature. Um, albedo, reflectance, photosynthetic rate of the grasses versus the trees, and the ability of herbivores to do snow packing in the winter to allow better conduction of heat. So we've been asked questions about this since 2006, but we didn't really have any funding until 2021. Um, but it was it was fun talking about it, and we did we did do a few experiments. Um, so uh, it's elephants like snow. Um, they'll build these giant snowballs. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I visited many of these elephant uh, facilities. Um, the thing is they, they can't survive at minus 40 for months at a time, which is what the mammoths could do. So we were looking for the, the set of genes that will help at a, at a minimum uh, achieve cold tolerance. And that will give the endangered elephant species a whole new um, a home to live in far from the conflict with humans that they're currently in uh, because they're this population density in the art in certain parts of the arctic are as close as zero as you can get so uh, another feature of elephants uh, that, that we observe is that they like knocking down trees uh, you can find dozens of these uh, videos on online where they knock down some pretty big ones the arctic trees are much smaller than these uh, African trees, um, and they'll just some of them they eat the upper branches, like as, you know, is their solution to the giraffe problem. But uh, others don't look very tasty, like that one. And and anyway, that they they love doing this, and um, and that would be helpful in restoring uh, the Arctic to its previous. High, higher biodiversity and um, and higher um, um, uh, suitability for sequestering carbon and, and lowering temperature. So I'm going to talk about what how what we're doing, what we're changing, um, where where we are in this. One thing that one can change is size. Um, so um, to give you some perspective, the smallest uh, of the elephant family this pink thing in the far right, lower right, um, was only 0.3 um, tons, and the largest was 22 tons. Um, and most elephants were are, are and were in between. And you can see a similar thing in dog species. 
Uh, there's also extreme variation in tusk size, which has been studied um, in modern elephants. Um, so, for example, some have almost no tusks or no tusks. Um, and this might has been speculated this is due to uh, avoid, avoiding uh, poachers and predators, uh, I mean, human predators that are just killing for the tusks. In, in some uh, parts of the world, uh, in Africa, they have uh, extraordinarily long tusks. And so, so the genes, here's one of the genes that's involved in this and a, and a paper on that. Um, furthermore, so this, this, this was work from uh, a laboratory I was a postdoctoral fellow in, but I didn't have anything to do with it, um, where tusks, where, where you can make tusk-like structures in a mouse um, using, again, known genes. Um, and you can also induce um, tooth-like structures in teratomas. So again, Gail Martin's lab developed uh, some of the uh, early work on teratomas, and we use them routinely for testing our pluripotent stem cells. But here, here are tooths uh, that, that where you can actually take human stem cells and put them into mice and get these uh, teratomas. That I'll show you another one in just a moment. It's just instead of having teeth, it has hair. Another gene that has been restored. So this is a bona fide mammoth gene that has been brought back um, from extinction uh, convincingly, and it has uh, uh, significant physiological differences in response to oxygen and temperature, um, which is consistent with um, some evolutionary pressure on it to be able to adapt the blood so it can carry, so it can release uh, carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen at low temperatures. Um, so here is uh, hair. This is one of the um, multiple features of cold tolerance. In, in addition to uh, 10 centimeters of fat everywhere, there's there's a woolly and, and long hair. It's about five different kinds of hairs. Um, and you can see the difference between the modern elephant on the right and the mammoth on the left. Uh, and here's an example of, of two human mutants that go in opposite directions that show the, the, this, that these genes are known in humans. And there's also this model where we get tested early on using these teratomas. So we can engineer the cells and test them by making these sort of um, slightly disordered developmental systems in mice um, that, that can show um, property, some properties that you want. But the, the, the ultimate is um, test of the functionality is, of course, to um, go through full development. Um, external ear size is another uh, thing for which uh, uh, phenotype, for which you can see the mammoth is the smallest, uh, Asian inter inter intermediate, and then the African. Um, and so these range from 4.4 uh, square meters down to 0.16. Uh, temperature sensation. So there are molecules involved in this, the, the TRP family, trip A, trip M, trip B. And one of these, trip V, has been brought back by uh, Schuster and his coworkers uh, and shown in human cells, not yet ele elephant cells, to have. Um, very characteristic changes in the temperature curves. Um, so here's a list of, you know, kind of our, our top 81 um, alleles that we think are causative uh, for some of the things that we want to have in a cold resistant elephant. We're not limited to, to well annotated genes. We can also look for genes that just simply uh, increased in abundance and fixed in the, the meaning that they um, that in every every elephant that's been an, an, analyzed, that both the maternal and paternal, the two alleles, um, are both the same thing, and they're both different from what's in modern species. So we're looking for things where the genetic composition has changed radically um, and completely, and, and those don't we don't need to know what they are. We can just introduce them and find out what they they can. But these are things that are that are both of that nature, where they've been. They in the lineage that led to mammoths were um, became dominant um, and different from modern elephants. Plus, they have annotations that that, that benefit from human genetics, from 
um, development and model organisms and so forth. And so the two that have been brought back so far, the de-extinction progress so far is, hemo is hemoglobin and trip D3, two out of 81. But that's changing very rapidly. And, and I'll show you in a moment what we've done to make it possible to make to make a large number of edits. I already showed you our record is 24,000, but that was in human cells and culture. This is in, in a large mammal um, breeding in, uh, you know, in a, uh, uh, in a facility designed for, for uh, breeding pigs. And we've made 42 edits in these ones, which was a wish list, a combined wish list of everybody since the very first transplant between animals and humans in 1963, a, six, a nine month success uh, transplant of a kidney yeah, from a chimpanzee. We can no longer use chimpanzees um, for ethical reasons, but pigs are uh, okay. And we've uh, these series of papers here. Luhan Yang was a uh, graduate student and postdoc in my lab and co-founder of eGenesis in Kihan in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in uh, Hangzhou. Anyway, we made, we made all these uh, genetic changes successfully, and they're breeding fine, and they're donating organs to um, in preclinical and clinical trials. Now we don't want to just, we're not just making organs to deal with the organ shortage crisis, but also to do enhancements. We want to make them pathogen resistant, cancer senescence and immune resistant. Um, and so when we, when we look at senescence resistance, we have a, an age database that, that uh, Pedro de Magalas developed in, as a postdoc in my lab and still maintains it's the best uh, aging database. And uh, we, we use this to find some candidate genes and whittled it down to 45, which we turned into gene therapies in, in mouse. We're focusing on genes that can be distributed through the blood. Um, and here's three of them, for example, a, a cocktail of three different genes in gene therapy that we think address many of the 10 pathways that are well understood, the 10 hallmarks or pathways of aging. And um, various subsets of these eight diseases, which have nothing, very little in common other than they are diseases of aging. The first paper we published in PNS was just the top four, but since then we've extended it to other species, other diseases, both in mice and uh, in dogs. So for example, the mitral valve disease um, afflicts a particular um, strain of spaniels. And this is Noah Davidson, who is postdoc in my lab, published these co-authored these four papers and started Rejuvenate Bio. Uh, elephants uh, ha and, and the endangered elephants are partly endangered because of a deadly herpes virus that kills at least 25% at, at around the wean time of weaning. And we've collaborated with Paul Ling and his collaborators in Texas on this. It's a, you know, like other herpes viruses has a very large genome and it's been very hard to grow in, in culture. Uh, we have a number of different ways of, of uh, dealing with this, either making self-administered va vaccines, which is, you know, through synthetic biology. Um, Paul is working on conventional vaccines, which can be delivered in zoos, but we need to deal with wild species um, and, and CRISPR. And I'll show you an example of CRISPR in just a moment. Um, but before that, I just want to uh, comment on um, how vaccines are an example of, of this progress in gene therapy that I mentioned in my first, you know, impossible, useless slide. Um, the cost um, of the first, first one of the first approved um, gene therapies was $2.5 million per dose. Since then, there's a new one that's $2.8 million a dose. But if you look at the top five um, COVID-19 vaccines, all five of those were based on gene therapy formulations. Uh, three of them um, in the middle here were based on adenoviral delivery of double-stranded DNA, and two of them on lipid nanoparticle delivery of messenger RNA. And, um, and these are as low as $2 a dose. So from 2.8 million to $2, sim simply or mainly due to the, you know, the size of the societal need, the number of people uh, impacted. And of course, the, the best ever for any technology that I can think of, including you know electronics, refrigeration, you name it, is smallpox, because that is now zero dollars 
for everybody on the planet, uh, equitably distributed, very important ethics component um, because it's extinct. So we, um, you should, you could say that we shouldn't be de-extincting or extincting, um, but I think there are very good examples of each. So I said I was going to talk about CRISPR for fighting viruses. Here are um, um, African swine fever virus is a pandemic in animals and pigs in particular, and uh, it's spread through most of the countries, um, indicated in colors here. Uh, and we decided to use CRISPR the way it was intended to be, the way it was uh, evolved to be, which is it, it in nature, not in the lab, but in nature, it basically kills viruses by uh, making double strand breaks, which is lethal. Um, so, uh, so we tried this, could, could it work? Not, and that's in, in bacteria. We asked, can that do the same thing in, um, in, in pig genomes? And so we introduced um, six different CRISPRs aimed at different parts of the African swine fever virus genome and showed that we could get some herd immunity. This is not dramatic individual immunity, but in herd, um, it's very hard to, in, to uh, transfer. It reduces the transfer of viruses from uh, uh, an engineered organism to another engineered organism. So that's, that's progress. And we may try something like that in the uh, elephants for EEHV. We have a more general, but in a certain sense, more general method that will get all viruses, but maybe uh, harder to implement. Um, but we have implemented it now for one cell. Um, this, this started our first demonstration. This was around 2013, where we eliminated seven, about five out of seven categories of virus, not quite all. But now today, I'll show you how we've gotten all of them. And this, has, uh, we've changed the genetic code. There's 64 triplet codons. All, uh, all possible combinations of three of the four, you know, the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T, to produce 20 amino acids. We change that code, one of the codes, genome-wide, that's what all these little blue tick marks mean around the circular genome of E. coli. And, uh, and these are all the authors that have contributed, um, or some of the first authors. Uh, we do biocontainment, uh, so DNA, can't, DNA and RNA can't go in or out of the cell, and the cell itself cannot benefit from being resistant to all viruses, which could, you could imagine, provide a, an advantage in the wild. So we really need to have all these containments at once. We can't just do part of them. This is showing uh, this five out of seven, these asterisks meaning very significant down to zero from a starting point of, you know, almost a trillion black forming units per um, milliliter down to zero unrecoverable but still not all viruses. So the last set of viruses were, um, we found 12 phages that could replicate in the previous best host that was best meaning most resistant. So we did some field work here um, and went um, on the you know, farm sewage uh, and as many different ecosystems as we could sample that we thought might have um, phages and found lots, found thousands of them. That um, that will will infect every all of the best previous ones, and we and we bought these finally got these ones by doing a swap where we swapped every place there was a one of these two serine codons we changed it to a coding for leucine. So the serine and leucine are about as different as you can be in the amino acid space, and uh, and this did the trick. We we have not detected any viruses from any of these isolates, um, and all those classic laboratory strains. Okay, so now uh, back to moving back towards uh, uh, humans and uh, elephants, we can we can now make a large transcription vector library. We have made a large transcription vector library and have 290 different recipes for different uh, organs that, that are, or tissues that we can make, including this one where we can make a, a type of cell that wraps your neurons with uh, myelin. Uh, which is the white matter in your brain where in the, in the spinal column where the, the signals go faster and demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis, we can fix these in mice by implanting these human um, oligodendrocytes and rescue them in these preclinical trials. We've, we've taken that, we've done, like I said, 290 different recipes 
and two of the most recent ones uh, have to do with um, human reproduction. And we, we're transferring these protocols from mouse and humans into elephants. Um, but these are two bioarchive papers. We have um, uh, germ cell production, um, oocytes, and granulosa cells that help mature those oocytes to get them um, hopefully through meiosis and um, to fertilization. I should also point out work from uh, from other groups. Um, physicians around the world have helped um, pr human preemies, premature births, go as far back as 47% in the nine month gestation. And in mouse, um, there's, been enough, there's been progress in getting forward 55%. So you could say, well, 55 and 47 sort of overlap, but it's not that simple. We need to really get a rethink the process of getting all the way through gestation in vitro, ex utero, which we're doing. And then we're getting close to the Q&A part now. So start queuing up your questions. Um, we're, uh, after we get through the reproductive, um, um, in vitro reproductive, which we think can scale much better than the surrogate method that we use for pigs. Um, there's a, a, a infinite supply of pig surrogates, but there's very limited supply of the endangered uh, elephants, um, um, potential mothers at the right age. Um, anyway, once, once uh, there's a lot of experience, the world unfortunately has a lot of experience with elephant orphans and how to get them through um, with um, uh, goat milk, with formula based on goat milk. And I just want to remind, maybe remind you of how wolves are a keystone species, just like elephants are. And, and that mean, what that means in practice, and this was tested, after 70 years of having no wolves in Yellowstone National Park in America, um, the, they reintroduced the wolves and they expected some, what they found, which was that the wolves um, reduced the populations of, of the large herbivores, which resulted in, in the, the trees finally being restored, which resulted in beavers using the trees to change the rivers and lake systems and, um, um, and, and hence the, the fish and amphibia and other species returned. And so this, this one species had this all this huge effect on uh, various plants and animals. And the same thing could happen in elephants. I already went through the three things that could happen and so forth. Um, rewilding is not limited to wolves. Uh, there's California condors, bisons, and about a thousand different experiments with species introduced across um, around the world uh, over the last century. Uh, we will be focusing on regions with low human population and high carbon. We want to move. We want to give these endangered species new homes, which are not in conflict with humans. And we're particularly concerned about the parts of the Arctic where there's a lot of carbon at risk of turning, re being released as methane. And these high carbon regions also represent, in, in orange here, represent regions where we could sequester new carbon, CO2 from the air. Uh, because they've demonstrated in the past that they can they can fix and sequester carbon. We just need to keep them from melting and the, get get the grass going at, at high photosynthetic rates. Um, we're looking at uh, you know how elephants decide to migrate because we we can put them in places of low population densities, but we want them to spread. We want them we might want to spread them in particular directions. We think we might be able, they love uh, forbs. It's like they like knocking down trees. They also like these forbs, these small flowering plants. Um, and so it's, it's possible that we can direct them by some, uh, you know, carrot uh, rather than a stick. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions in just a second. I just wanna, I've been thanking people all the way along, um, but this is the thanks for the last uh, few slides where um, Revive and Restore, Stuart and Ryan um, helped, helped me cook up the uh, uh, extinction of genes from the very beginning. Sergey and Nikita, I've mentioned father and son at the spearheaded Pleistocene Park and a lot of the modern thought about um, 
uh, carbon sequestration in the Arctic, which I think was right, uh, even though most people said he was wrong for uh, over a decade. Some of my Harvard uh, postdoctoral fellows, uh, Ariana, Justin, Margot, Bobby, Jessica, and Ben Lamb, who's been fantastic at getting Colossal going, bringing us from starvation uh, to um, to enough money that we can get the project done. Period, full stop, and uh, let's see if there's, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And for everybody that has questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or just jump in and ask them directly. Uh, if you're not comfortable with that, you can send it in the chat and I can uh, read it out. Or you can send it directly to me. Right, I guess I can start out while well, like, people gather their thoughts. Uh, so I was also wondering, uh, how, like you may have been on one of the last slides, but how large of a scale um, do you plan on having, or would you need to release, like how many elephants would you need to release into the the wild in order to have your desired effects? Um, so we're, we're, we're doing a lot of modeling uh, at both ourselves in collaboration with uh, ecosystem modelers. And uh, our preliminary estimate is, is in the tens of thousands. There were uh, at, the, at the peak uh, close to one elephant-like creature per square kilometer. So if we did the full 19 million square kilometers, that, that would be 90 million elephants uh, or mammoths or, or Arctic elephants. Mm -hmm. And But we're not going to do that. We're more like 5% are those orange regions that, with the color, false colored orange for, for high carbon content. So we'll be focusing on those places that are far from human populations and high in carbon. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so we think tens of thousands would, would have a perceptible impact on, on the carbon, uh, both uh, in terms of preventing re release and sequestering new carbon. Yeah, and, and just a follow up to that, you spoke of the the difficulty of getting access to the like Asian elephants because they're endangered. So I was wondering what how, what the strategy for scaling up to possibly tens of thousands would be. Yeah, so we have access to surrogates. It's just we would prefer not to use them for scale up. We might use them for some of the first. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, part of that is because the cloning procedure is is inefficient, at least in the animals that, that we have experience with, like pig. Um, so so the so I mentioned the 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 reproduction in vitro ex utero um, is progress is you know beginning uh right now uh and that has two advantages one is for research uh before scale up we can potentially make millions of uh embryos uh, which develop partially and, mm -hmm. and to, to make sure our phenotypes are uh, you know healthy and have the new properties uh and then so that's just kind of in a lab scale and then for scaling up in the wild we can set up we can transport embryos much more easily than we can transport you know baby elephants or mature elephants and and then we can set up um incubation centers at the hubs where we eventually want them to grow up we can also have them uh, gestate there as well so that's that's our tentative plan um and we've got a pretty big team working on it uh including doing similar things in the marsupial you, you mentioned in your intro that we're doing the the Tasmanian tiger or thylacine, um, that has the advantage, or some marsupials have the advantage that they have incredibly short gestation, even shorter than mice, as little as 11 day gestation. And most of that time is not implanted into the uterine wall. They they essentially are planned premature births where they kind of fall up with, with their fore, forelimbs and, and start uh, nursing early. So, um, so we're studying these two radically different systems for for looking for progress in um, in mammalian development uh, outside of the, the body. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Jared. 
Thanks, Liam, and thank you, Professor Church, for your lecture. Um, my question was is related to Liam's um, sort of has to do with the numbers game, um, and it was what are the time frames that you predict an Asian elephant with mammoth genes could significantly alter the Arctic ecosystem, especially given the you know the current predictions that you know different scientists, different news outlets are throwing out there of how much time we you know, really have left to make an impact or, or change. Uh, before I answer that, I'll ask you, what, how much time do you think we have left? Well, that's a good question. Maybe, I, I think 50 years sounds okay. about right. Yeah, I, I think that there's a kind of general consensus around there. Yeah. Um, and we're already seeing consequences, however. So it's mel it is melting the Arctic a little bit faster than other parts of the world. And uh, and that and that could cause a positive feedback loop, so that even if the humans left the planet tomorrow, this feedback loop could could continue to to release methane, which could cause more warming and so forth. Um, so fifty years, let's say, um, we we uh, Colossal, the company uh, Ben Lamb, has set a pretty aggressive goal of six years to get to the first engineered elephant. So. So there, there are various baby steps along the way or, or steps along the way to uh, what you asked for. And so one of them is just getting an engineered elephant of any sort. We've, so we've engineered pigs at multiple sites, about the same number of sites we'd like to try out in elephants. So it's a matter of basically transferring that technology from pigs to elephants. Um, that's six years. In parallel with that, we'll be working on the scaling and the uh, in vitro reproduction uh, hopefully that that will kick in maybe a year later um, if we've been do, doing the parallel work. Um, and then it you know will take them about eight years to get to uh, uh, some of to sexual maturity, and then they can start uh, producing them the normal way. But we're not counting on that any of that happening. Um, uh, they'll also be old enough to do migration and knocking down trees, which we are counting on. Um, but the reproduction, we expect a huge fraction of it to be by this scale up method. Great, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. And it looks like no one else has a question, but I have a, another. I was, uh, wondering if there are any plans to rewild extinct genes from species that aren't necessarily extinct, um, like cheetahs or rhinoceroses, which have gone through like large population bottlenecks and have like a great loss of um, genetic diversity. Uh, are there any plans for that? Yeah, absolutely. We, I mean, we're, we're mostly a, an endangered species company, not an extinct species company. We just happen to be using extinct genes. And, and I think that, um, I mean, there's two sources of diversity. There's, well, many sources. One of them is geographic, one of them is time. So we can go as far back as a million years in time. And elephants, even though they're in very small number of locations today, they were present on every continent except for Antarctica and uh, Australia. And so we've got this vast space and time to draw from. Furthermore, uh, we can draw from related species. I mean, in principle, we could draw from polar bear, Arctic fish, penguins. Uh, we're not totally limited. And I showed some examples from human where we can be inspired by the alleles in humans that we know a great deal about. Um, uh, examples of a uh, bottleneck. So, so a, a species that's become inbred or bottlenecked isn't necessarily at a huge, they can go for, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of years uh, with a low diversity, as long as their environment doesn't change. But a lot of environments are changing due to, you know, pipelines going in and other species invasion and so forth. So we, we need to give them that diversity. A, a, a beautiful example is the Tasmanian devil, which um, uh, is so inbred that when it bites, you know, when it does this sort of the male fighting, biting thing, uh, they, they they cause wounds in the face, and those wounds get some saliva in, and the saliva has a infectious cancer, one of the rare infectious cancers. And it only works because normally we would reject the cancer, saying we reject an organ transplant, but they're they're inbred. So 
So there we know exactly what to bring back is the histocompatibility loci that causes graft rejection and maybe some other um, you know, specific tumor um, uh, resistance genes. Um, and again, these can be, these can be uh, brought back from museum specimens or um, you know, from, from a whole variety, or even from other species. Yeah, thank you for that. And John? Yeah, hi there. Thanks for your uh, lecture. Very interesting. I just had a quick question um, about this approach of, of incorporating different genes. Do you think there, there will be any like secondary effects like on lifespan or, or diet or metabolism that might, might be caused by that approach? Um, or, yeah. it, it, it. It, well, it is, and we can do that intentionally rather than accidentally. So we are working, we have shown various ways that we can double the lifespan of various model organisms, including mice. So we could, if we wanted them to live longer, we could. Um, um, the All of these species, the African elephant, the Asian elephant, the mammoth, are all very similar in genome sequence. Uh, I wouldn't call it inbred, but they're very similar. They probably have all interbred, uh, making, uh, producing viable offspring. In fact, there's at least one known example between African and Asian, which are the two most distant species. Uh, Asian and mammoth are the two closest species. Um, and if you look in their genomes, you see lots of examples of this hybridization going on. So what you maybe mentioned this already, but what kind of lifespan are you expecting? Uh, well, you know, 55, 60 years is pretty ordinary for, for most living uh, elephants. Um, they have famously uh, good memories over that long period of time. Um, but that's that, that I, I don't see any reason why we would affect that, pause, make it longer or shorter. Okay. All right, thanks. And I guess one final question from my end. Uh, I know you discussed uh, studying the more rapid um, like marsupial uh, reproduction rates as well as modifying um, other organisms in order to speed up, speed up the rates at which they can reproduce. So is that ultimately, or not ultimately, but will it will those techniques be applied to speeding up the reproductive cycle of, uh, of the Arctic elephants? Um, we haven't ruled that out. Uh, uh, it's not a top priority. We think we can do just fine with uh, the current gestation periods, but we're going to keep a, a, an eye to that. Um, you know, certainly, the, the whales have an extraordinary rate of growth um, uh, as well, that they, they, they're, for example, the nerves that go down their spinal column uh, grow at a, at a rate that's barely explainable. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'll we'll be looking at that, but I, I think that's that's going to be considered icing on the cake rather than than the food itself. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And any any last questions? It looks like not, but thank you very much for coming and giving this lecture. Uh, it was very enlightening. Uh, it's also quite different than I think what we're used to hosting. And uh, I think that's good because we're trying to get more of a, a diversity of views on, on the past and methods uh, at looking at it and applying applying that knowledge to, to bettering the present and future. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, uh, good, good, good luck on all your um, endeavors in the future. Take Thank care. You.